so excited to be here. Let me, let's all take a moment to appreciate how amazing it is to be in a room of like a hundred something people that all really love CSS and like love thinking about CSS. Like this doesn't happen very often. This is great. So, okay, so hi, my name is Laura. And uh, I did grow up on a llama farm. That's true. They were more like lawn ornaments though, not really uh, anything we farmed or ate. So to be clear. Okay, algorithms in CSS. This is my talk. This is version three of it. Let's dive right in. Is CSS a programming language? Fire emoji. Follow this up. How many of you all have A, kind of contemplated this before, or B, seen kind of Twitter drama revolved, related to this question in the last like six months? Okay, yeah, there's like a lot of yeah, hot, hot drama on Twitter. So I guess I'm part of that. Um, is CSS a programming language? Well, I asked this question on Twitter. <laughs> uh, this is the first time I asked it in March of 2018. And that was before I gave the uh, first version of this talk, which was at CSSConf EU last year. Is CSS a programming language? Crowd says, no. <laughs> okay, but this is a pretty split, split uh, data set here. So we have 42% yes, 50% no, 8% I'm not sure. Only 129 votes, fine. Uh, but the comments here were interesting. It was like either yes, absolutely, or things like, um, I don't really consider CSS as a programming language. Or like, no, you can't call writing styles programming. Like, no. And so I was like, okay, hold on, stop. Like, it sounds like there may be some opinions getting mixed in with facts here. Like, what's going on? Can't we like ask this question? What is a programming language? So that was like a big part of the research I did for this talk. And it turns out there's a lot of research about what a programming language is and what programming languages are because that is the whole of computer science. Um, and we can't really limit what the definition is of a programming language because there are so many types of programming languages. So a definition for us. A programming language is a formal language for instructing a computer to perform tasks. Wow. Oh my god. Okay, so this is kind of paraphrased from Wikipedia and others. There are for sure more narrow definitions and more open definitions even. Um, but it kind of boils down to this very large concept of language. The important part here is language. Um, and within the kind of sphere of programming languages, we have programming paradigms. And programming paradigms can be either referred to specific structures of a language or styles of writing code. So we also have a um, imperative and declarative styles of writing code. And imperative refers to how. So an imperative language means you are writing instructions in for a computer how to do something. So the main difference is the presence of control flow and no control flow. So that how part and control flow means you're saying like uh, manipulating the order of execution of these statements um, with explicit control flow logic. Where on the declarative side, all of that logic is baked into the statement itself and is determined based on some kind of underlying uh, implementation of the language. So what are some imperative and declarative languages, anyone? Well, imperative languages are what we usually think of as programming languages because these are oftentimes general purpose languages. So JavaScript, Ruby, C++, Python. Declarative languages, on the other hand, are oftentimes domain specific. There are a few general purpose declarative languages, but usually domain specific. Um, and of course, SQL is a domain specific declarative programming language for databases. HTML is a domain specific declarative programming language for adding meaning to content on a web page. And CSS, oh my god, is a domain specific declarative programming language for styling web page layout. Okay. CSS is a domain specific declarative programming language. 100%. Got it. I think we all understand that now. CSS developers program the layout of web pages. Program. Yes, we write programs. Boxes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, we are kind of box programmers in a lot of ways. Okay, 100%. Is CSS a programming language? March 2019. I was, before I asked this, I was a little bit hesitant because I was like, okay, everybody knows my shtick. Like my Twitter followers, they all know like, okay, Laura does this algorithms talk, whatever. I saw it. Why does she keep asking this question? And so I expected like maybe 100 votes, all yes. <laughs> no. This had, <laughs> this had 
5,324 votes, which by my Twitter usage standard is like an astronomical amount of activity on a tweet. So I was like, okay, what is going on? I guess I didn't change a lot of minds. And now we're at 53%. No, what happened? So what was interesting here, like I, um, I really thought the demographic of people saying no were the people that did not understand CSS. So I thought it was people coming from JavaScript or backend, and they're like, I never really written, had written CSS or taken time to look into it. Uh, but there were also comments from people that absolutely know CSS that were kind of like, no, I don't, it's not, we want this to be a separate thing. So there was kind of this like movement towards defining CSS as something else and also a lot of responses that were like, stop talking about this. Don't stir the pot anymore. <laughs> so, uh, okay, well, that's that. Um, so yes, this is Twitter, this is a can, and this is a can of worms and opinions. Yes, I know that this is what Twitter is. So I was like, what, like, what, where is this coming from? And I was you know, thinking, I was like, well, maybe everybody just really has a subjective understanding of what a programming language is. And no, you know, a lot of us never took computer science classes or spent time looking into what a programming language is, um, such as myself. So maybe everybody just has a different understanding. And that's what this is. So, well, I think, so the thing is though, this has consequences, I think, and there are bad things happening because we don't see CSS as a programming language. I would like to talk about turd-driven development. <laughs> so this is a, a riff on test-driven development, which is a really wonderful programming practice. Um, but turd-driven development is often what we fall into when we don't really respect the code that we're writing. So there's this is an assumption, and this is the assumption along the lines of test-driven development as well. Similar, with, same with turds. So all code is poop at first, a turd at first. So you can never write perfect code the first time you write it. So in test-driven development, you don't write code first. You write a test first. So you write a test to figure out what code you're writing. So what, what am I going to write? Like What is the thing I'm going to write going to do first? And then you write junk code. But in CSS, we don't have testing like that that I am aware of. Um, so we kind of use the design as the test in this case. So when our, whatever we're programming, whatever code we're writing, when that matches the design, that means our test passes. So we write some CSS. This is the first time I wrote it, so it's poop. And then we stop. <laughs> and we're like, okay, some time goes by. Like I wrote my CSS, cool. Like, oh, wait, new feature, the test is failing. Okay, so now what do I do? I write more CSS. <laughs> and then, oh, maybe there's a, a small re regression. So what do I do? I write more CSS. And then stop for a while, and time goes on. Oh, new feature, more CSS. And on and on this continues until our design and our test is no longer even passing. And so we get kind of that, that shot from Brad Frost's talk yesterday is like the design, production. And so there's no even like acknowledging of the test anymore. So the test is turning into a, just a comp continually failing, uh, failing test here. So we have a lot of gross code. The problem is this is the, <laughs> this is like the front end of our application. <laughs> this is like the what, and of course like there are other languages involved in this process than just CSS, but this is how we kind of treat front end in a lot of cases, um, unless you've kind of gotten on the design system train, but there are a lot of companies out there that haven't done that yet, and that's a huge undertaking. So what do we do? Bah, this is so bad. Like, what can we possibly do to, fix, to like, stop this wheel? So stop writing CSS, start programming. Okay, so let's look at a few definitions of programming language, like what I was thinking people maybe have in their mind, like this kind of subjective, um, subjective understanding. And we're gonna go through three of these and hopefully give everybody some kind of talking points and a better understanding of what I mean when I say CSS as a programming language. So first, first definition here. There's our nice friend, hello. Okay, what is a programming language? Oh, I think a programming language is Turing complete. Okay, well, let's get into it. Alan Turing, 1936. He is the inventor of the Turing machine. And the Turing machine is a hypothetical machine that can compute anything. 
because computers were invented to do math. So the Turing machine was this research, in a, in a research paper, so a hypothetical machine that could compute any math problem. And it is the foundation of all modern digital devices. Pretty cool that that kind of fundamental concept started all the way back in 1936. So this is a Turing machine from my imagination. Remember, it was a hypothetical machine. Um, but maybe this is what it looked like, could have looked like this. So there was this really long tape of ones and zeros um, and kind of a card that uh, gave some specification for how the machine would move throughout state. So we have this read-write head um, that would update ones and zeros, and then this infinite tape. <clears throat> so you could compute any problem of any size. So the parameters for whether or not something is Turing complete can be boiled down to Conditional branching, so if-else logic and the ability to update state based on that logic. And infinite memory, um, also related to undecidability, which is the phenomenon of extremely com or like complex algorithms and complex problems that will never terminate. So you essentially, in a, in a Turing complete, if something, for something to be Turing complete, you need to be able to run one of these algorithms and have it never stop. So it's almost like it needs to fail for a certain thing infinite memory, we're kind of limited by atoms in the universe. So this second part is often kind of disregarded because a computer will run out of memory at some point. Okay, we also need to talk about elementary cellular automata. How many of you have seen uh, Conway's Game of Life before? Okay, so that is a cellular automaton. And elementary cellular automata, <laughs> automata are uh, these. So they're very sim much more, uh, much simpler kind of one-dimensional rule sets. And you have this rule set, and it will generate a certain pattern based on that rule set. And rule 110, specifically, is shown to be Turing complete. So these, these automata are essentially like discrete models for machines and for computation. So this is a, a rule. So we have these um, boxes, <laughs> no, uh, cells. <laughs> so each one uh, cor corresponds to a set of three cells that you start with. So if you start with a row of cells, um, and I kind of pick three, and I need to, I'm using this algorithm to generate the next row of cells. So I pick those three, um, and then the, because this is zero, zero, one, or white, white, black, I know I'm gonna generate a black cell. So if I move over one, zero, one, zero, I check it out in the rule, and I know that's gonna be a black one also. I move over one more, and so on. And that's gonna be black. So let's look at this in, some programming languages. So this logic, so I have one, zero, zero, generate a one. In an imperative language, language, it would look like this. So if cell one equals one and cell two equals zero, or what is it? yeah, and cell two equals zero and cell three equals zero, then set cell four to one. So turn cell four black. In declarative code, it's a little different, but not that different. So we use inputs to track to uh, track state here. So input checked is gonna be our one. Input not checked, we're selecting um, not checked, so input not, blah, blah, blah. and then targeting the fourth cell with a universal selector. So to see this in a larger grid, there would be a lot of these asterisk selectors to target the cell at the bottom. And then we style the fourth cell to prompt a human to actually change, update the state, so actually click that checkbox. So CSS itself, cannot update the state of that checkbox. This is what it looks like in a code pen. <laughs> Ta-da! <laughs> CSS plus HTML plus user is Turing complete. Amazing! <laughs> okay, so the thing is, like if you, there, I definitely see there's a um, some Stack Overflow thread that's like, CSS, is this CSS Turing complete? And the general answer can be assume you can look at, scan it, and be like, oh yeah, CSS is Turing complete. As far as I know, by itself, CSS is not. There may be some way to update state in that fashion with um, either like an animation play state or possibly in CSS Grid. Challenge everyone to figure that out. That would be really cool. <laughs> um, but for our purposes here. This is our kind of trifecta, and this is a very powerful trifecta. CSS plus HTML plus the user? 
It's pretty cool. That's kind of the, when we talk about being UI developers and design engineers, UX engineers, front of the front end designers, I feel like this is really our language, the CSS plus HTML plus understanding the user. What are some other things that are Turing complete? SQL, our favorite domain specific declarative database language. Excel, for sure, scripting spreadsheets. Pokemon Yellow. Minecraft. <laughs> Magic the Gathering? Are these programming languages? Interesting. So, Pikachu. All right, so back to our friend here. You think, okay, so we can say, along with HTML and user input, CSS is definitely Turing complete. Also, Pokemon Yellow is Turing complete. Whoa, fun facts, thanks. Does that mean that Pokemon Yellow is also a programming language by your definition? <laughs> and then they'll be like, uh, okay, done with this conversation. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> okay, another friend, definition two. What's a programming language? I think a programming language has consequences. Okay, so now we're going to do a bit of not live coding and build some squares. I'm serious, I'm not gonna code these, they're all on slides. So, all right, here's a square. This is our, okay, right back to our, whoops. Squares, building a square, this looks like a pretty great square. We're gonna do kind of a system of squares. So I wanna make the abilities bigger, smaller. I'm just gonna kinda click through. I don't need to explain this, I think we're all pretty good at CSS. We can get this. Ooh. Oh, the design changed. <laughs> oh, okay. Hmm. Oh. <laughs> what's gonna happen. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> no! <laughs> oh my god, it hurts so much. Okay, what's gonna happen now? <laughs> and on and on we go. Turd driven development, everyone. <laughs> okay, so What's the problem here? Turret driven development. Why, like, how does that happen? Ruling house of cards. Oh my God, careful. So when we have this kind of brittle structure where that, that shape was responsible for everything, that name shape, and we're kind of building this house of cards where like another developer comes in, they're like, what was going on? Pull one thing out, like everything breaks, and it is extremely expensive. It's so many resources to develop like that. So this is an actual house of cards in one of PMC's code bases. <laughs> so there's like, I, don't, I can't count this that quickly, but like 25 different versions of card. And let's look at this markup a little closer. So definitely someone came in, didn't really understand BIM entirely. And like no fault of their own, like the way PMC operates, we would have these agencies build out sites and they did a great job, but then other developers come in and they don't understand um, the exact conventions that the agency used, and so everything just kind of turns into this. One of our great, or one of our difficulties will be the maintenance of an appropriate discipline so that we do not lose track of what we are doing. This is from Alan Turing in 1945. Oh my God, excellent foresight. Okay. <laughs> So keywords here, appropriate discipline, lose track of what we are doing, major consequences for this. CSS is absolutely, that's possible. Okay, programming methodologies to the rescue. There are decades of people that have been working on solutions to these problems. So we kind of have on one side, general software development methodologies. 
object-oriented programming, agile, design patterns, testing, refactoring, abstractions, encapsulation, the solid principles, some object-oriented guidelines. Um, then we kind of have some like parallel thinking. This is my observation. I feel like we have some parallel thinking here over on in the front end world. We have design systems and parallel thinking, but I want to point out like we are also incorporating this design language. So we're kind of like contending with these two worlds. Um, and we have our own methodologies. So lot, lots of different, you know, can go on forever here. But I think there's a lot of overlap in these. And something I've been doing as I was working on this talk is like really looking at where those overlaps are. And it's been like fascinating. I've been learning a lot of things and having new ideas about how to structure CSS and solve these hard problems in big code bases. Applies to small code bases too. So, and this is a quote from Harry Roberts on CSS wizardry. So he created IT CSS, lots of things. So I try to borrow paradigms from software engineering. Software engineers have been solving these problems since long before I was a twinkle in my father's eye. So it's in my interest to see how they go about it, of course. Makes sense. Naming is so hard and extremely important. I feel like if there's anything that shows that CSS is a programming language, it's that naming is hard. Square. <laughs> Will it always be a square? No, it would be, like pretty much immediately became a circle. Probably not. Shape. Isn't everything a shape? <laughs> what is life? <laughs> That's how I feel about cards. Cards are like the shape of naming. <laughs> okay, so from Robert C. Martin, who is one of the kind of founders of agile software development methodologies, um, he says, take care with your names and change them when you find better ones. Okay, so I think when we take this into account, Programming, and what programming is, does not equal this kind of association with math, science, and logic, and engineering that we have. But programming is more like writing. So this is a talk from Felina, who is a Dutch researcher here, um, lives in Leiden, and she gave this amazing talk called What is Programming Anyway? And she talks about how programming is writing, and she did a lot of research about the comparison between writing methodologies and programming methodologies. So both programming and writing can be described as the translation of a high-level idea into low-level statements, low-level sentences or statements. Agreed. So programming is writing instructions for computers that other developers are able to read and maintain. Okay, so there's one, one methodology in particular I want to point out that I think is kind of the key to why our shape became a turd so quickly. So single responsibility principle. Look at these nice kitchen tools. The wooden spoon is so good at being a spoon. The whisk is so good at being a whisk. And so on. Spatula. <laughs> spatula. Spatula is so good at being a spatula, knife, etc. What about this? I don't know if there are sporks in Europe in the same way they are in America. They're not very common in America because they're not that good. They're trying to do too much. A spork is this like mashup of a fork and a spoon and it ends up not really doing either thing very well. So if we look at our code, right off the bat, for our simple, extremely simple blue square, we're already doing two things, and we gave us a, pr a pretty declarative name. What, oh my god, like look at what this happened. So this shape thing now has all of these responsibilities. So what do we do? Whoa, interesting. Okay, so utilities, we can use utilities like this. And I know there's definitely, um, you know, on Twitter, et cetera, I've kind of read people are not so into the utility uh, pattern, but I think if you're working on, especially on teams, like this can be extremely useful to kind of pull out the utility from, or pull out these uh, different responsibilities and put them in utilities. And there's a nice square, so pretty simple. Okay, I think program manager has consequences. Oh, CSS has consequences, and we control them with programming methodologies. Sweet. Kind of a little awkward silence. <laughs> after that conversation. Okay, number three. Oh, hello. Okay, what is a programming language? I think you can write algorithms in a programming language. 
Dun, dun, dun. Okay, algorithms 101, let's talk about it. Yay! All right, an algorithm is a well-defined computational procedure that takes input and produces output. This is a definition from Thomas Corman, who wrote a large book called Introduction to Algorithms. I read the introduction. <laughs> <laughs> so here's our little map, our chart here for what an algorithm is. Input, sorting algorithms, this is a big thing. Unsorted numbers, output, sorted numbers. In the middle, what's gonna happen? Sort, uh, sorting algorithms, bubble sort, selection sort, merge sort, quick sort. Lucky for you, this box is only so tall. Let's look at the implementation of a sorting algorithm. Function, sort. This is bubble sort in imperative JavaScript. A little bit of heart, we like JavaScript. Um, and we can see the imperative, the control structure here. So I'm going in the manipulation of the order of execution of statements. So I go into this for loop and um, there's an if, so I'm kind of jumping back around and then call the function here, sort. So if this were declarative code, all we would see is the sort part. The algorithm itself would be abstracted. So it's like the beauty of declarative code is you don't have to write that algorithm. Okay, what about boxes? Input, a stack of boxes. Output, a row of boxes. What is the algorithm? Display flex. Float left. Gasp. No, floats are, we can still use floats. Um, okay. Cool. Declarative CSS, this is the implementation of our algorithm. Um, so the thing is, we have this, this the nature of a declarative language. So CSS kind of sits at the top and we have this imperative structure. So all the C++ and Rust, like some of which we just saw, um, sits underneath driving that. So, oh my God, so many algorithms under here for sure, big time. What about up here? Can we, like algorithms? Hmm? Algorithm? I don't know. So I'm like, why not? <laughs> That's kind of in the source of a lot of what we're working on. So why not? Algorithms 101, let's update this. CSS algorithms 101, domain specific, declarative. Okay, let's have a small story time that I will use to kind of uh, give an example of what an algorithm is. When, the CSS, when a CSS algorithm saved the day at PMC, so PMC is where I work. I am a design engineer at PMC. Some days I call myself a design ops engineer at PMC. And I definitely love my job, it's awesome. Work on big, cool WordPress sites, great people. Um, I'm also the design systems -er at PMC. So we kind of hear, hear these job titles like UX engineer des or design engineer, and a lot of times that translates to, okay, you work on a design system. I'm also the first and only so far front end developer at PMC <laughs> on a team of like, I think there's like pushing 30 engineers, maybe 20, between 20 and 30 engineers. Uh, because like I mentioned previously, we kind of outsourced all the uh, site builds to agencies, so they kind of took, took care of the front end. Um, okay, so this is Deadline. This is the kind of design system Big Bang project, so a pilot project like we learned about. And we built out a lot of great tooling and great practices in this project. So this is what the design, or I think that this is what the live site looks like, but also what the design looked like, because they look the same. Um, this is what Deadline actually looks like. <laughs> Ads. Or it looks like this. Oh my god. Ads are so bad. We built this beautiful thing and like this is, this is what it looks like. And it's so it's like, oh, uh, oh. Uh. Not gonna go on that ramp tirade. But ads do drive the business. Ads pay my salary in a lot of ways. So that's how it goes. So I see this pull request come in. Um, a couple weeks after the project launched, everything was going really smoothly. And so this, it's a little one-liner pull request. I'll let you all read what this is doing. <laughs> so this is changing the entire scale of the website to three quarters and removing the ability for users to zoom. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's happening? Just to kind of show what this is doing. Sorry, we have a hamburger menu, I know. Um, this is the tablet view. This is, this is what it should look like on tablet. So with that little bit of code, 
this is what it looks like. So it pulls the, it takes, as like it's between breakpoints, and so everything shrinks down. There's this like tiny text in the menu, and nobody's allowed to zoom in. Like this is horrible. So I was like, whoa. Um, so one, one good thing about PMC, well, there's a lot of good things about PMC, but we definitely will go back and fix stuff. If we do have to ship something, so like that code was shipped for, you know, the, the initial duration of this ad campaign because it's like in publishing and everything's very deadline driven. It's like, oh my God, ads, like people are mad. Okay. Um, so it did go out, but it came back and I was like, okay, let's write some CSS. So this is what was happening. This is kind of the, the reason this entire thing came to be. There was an ad being served on a tablet size and the ad was 960 wide, ads don't scale. Um, and the viewport is 768. Why was it like, what? Why is that happening in the first place? But that's how it was and that's how it was on the old site. So it had to work. This is what we can do, scale. <laughs> like, <laughs> like transform, scale the outer box down, make the ad smaller, don't make the entire website smaller. But like no fault of this, the person who was on the, the ad ops team that deployed this, that's what you have to do in a pinch. So I wrote a little algorithm for this and have a little A namespace and a very specific name so that nobody else writes things in here. And that was great. And two days later, I wasn't part of this at all. I see that little algorithm was deployed on a different brand. And I was like, oh my God, cool. Someone was able to like look at this and see exactly what I like, you know, nice naming, and it was able to be ported over. And now this other website is not completely botched on tablet. Great. End of story time. <laughs> CSS is so cool. I know. <laughs> okay, so CSS algorithm is a well-defined declaration or set of declarations that produces a specific styling output. Me. <laughs> okay, well-defined and specific are the keywords here. I wanna talk a little bit more about PMC and what we're doing there. This is the possible logo for our design system, which is named Larva. <laughs> it's a long story. Okay, well, not that long of a story, but I'm not gonna tell it during my talk. Okay, <clears throat> Larva. I consider Larva to be an embryonic design system uh, because it is currently inside of Deadline. <laughs> so it's like in a, a project and we don't actually have like components really or, or uh, UI elements because like I don't know what they are. Like we can't, uh, the design language is not really synced up and that's probably not gonna happen for a while just given the politics of the, the company. So in deadlines, so this is the, a screenshot of the, the kind of pa the patterns directory, which in a, and this is a WordPress theme. Um, I just kind of added this algorithms directory to a modified, slightly modified version of ITCSS uh, architecture. And I was like, at the beginning of the project, I was like, I wonder if this would be useful. So I just added this algorithms directory. And over the course of the project, I was like, oh my God, this is like a really useful way to think about writing my CSS. Because most of our CSS is utilities. But there were these chunks of declarations that I really wanted to reuse in different spots. Um, and here's the one example, a glue. Like, what is that? But, and thanks to Joe's talk, I have a good way of describing why this is a good thing. Um, this kind of layers on some procedural understanding of a very declarative set of knowledge. So CSS, this glue pattern is positioning. You add like a parent, a glue, a glue parent um, adds a position relative and then a glue itself um, uh, adds position absolute to an element that you want to glue on inside another element. And people kind of, like other developers kind of understood, well definitely understood this, someone else gave it this name. <clears throat> that was cool. And these other names like a become close button. What? Th that's what it does. <laughs> it, it turns something, it should be a become close button on hover, but that was long. So we also have these documented in the pattern library. So this is a, sp this also sounds funny, space children. <laughs> but this means like space your children. <laughs> Face your children. So there's like, a, and this has a little custom property and we document this alongside um, everything else in, in a, using the KSS generator, which is, is what it is. Um, okay, so there's this a little look at what our uh, markup looks like. There's a lot going on here, but it's all doing its own thing and we have really low specificity and it's working out well. So a couple of things have names, like article sidebar, TV features widget. Um, those don't have any CSS attached to them. The C heading and 
OT, so anything that's not a U or an A prefix, is like a potential component. So it, that might turn into an actual thing, C heading. But right now, it's maybe providing some base styles that are probably overwritten and mainly refers to the HTML itself. So it's, it's working. OK, so when do you make a CSS algorithm? It's kind of like a last resort thing. When you want to reuse some declarations and it doesn't fit into utilities. So if there's like a lot of media queries or pseudo elements and it just doesn't fit into utilities well. Um, and you don't want to name something. So like when you name something, you're like committing to maintaining that thing as its own thing. And that's kind of dangerous if you don't know that's going to maintain or be, be the same in the future. So, oh, I've been writing about a lot of this stuff on my blog on a, in a series I've called the Design Engineering Chronicles. And I give them these very specific names, and they're written in haste, but that's where a lot of this stuff is, uh, is happening. OK, so more than what an algorithm is, though, let's talk about how you write algorithms. Here's how you write algorithms in a whiteboarding interview. First, you plan the algorithm. So you would be like, oh, I've seen, you know, here's my studio code, got it. And then you write out a brute force solution, so you figure out um, kind of what the algorithm needs to do, get a general solution down, maybe not that performant. Then you do a walkthrough, kind of see exactly what, uh, how it's working, if it's working, and then you optimize it. So you layer in some, excuse me, different, different optimization solutions, et cetera. Here's how you write a CSS algorithm. First, you plan it. So you write some pseudocode, draw out some boxes, figure out exactly what you're doing. Then you write a brute force solution. And, you know, can be shitty, C excuse me, it can be bad, nasty CSS. <laughs> bad, nasty CSS, that's fine. Um, then you do walk through, see if it's, if it's doing what you need it to do, and then you optimize it. Oh my god, same thing. Okay, turd-driven development. I think this, this thinking is kind of the way, I don't know, this is what I'm trying to do, way to turn turd-driven development into test-driven development. So this is like the magic holy grail. I think like writing unit tests for CSS algorithms, I have like a lot of ideas about this. Um, please let me know if anybody has done anything like this. It's really, a, a, could be a good idea. Why not? Okay, so assumption, just a little bit of what test-driven development is. Assumption, we know this, all code is poop at first. Start with failing test, write code, then you refactor the code. <sighs> the missing piece! OK, you go back. You don't just leave the gross code. Um, then maybe your test fails, or you need to add a new feature. Test failing, write code, then you refactor it, and gradually morph into a beautiful flower. Yay. OK, smiles. Yeah, right. <laughs> but this, uh, uh, you can see it. OK, yay. <laughs> All right, so OK, friend. I think you can write algorithms in a programming language. Well, you can write CSS algorithms. Whoa, really? Yes, they are declarative and domain specific. So the thing is, these words, declarative and domain specific, kind of realizing like, I think we can get away with a lot. <laughs> like those are like the safe words <laughs> for CSS. Cause it's like, that basically means like, oh, okay, there are no rules for what these things are. Um, or no, I mean, okay. Oh, tell me more. People are interested in this. I've been giving this talk for a little bit. I'm giving this talk at multiple other conferences, not front-end conferences, uh, later in this summer. And people are interested in this concept of CSS algorithms. You say the word algorithm, people who don't necessarily know CSS, but know other types of programming, are like, oh, I know what an algorithm is. So maybe we could kind of frame CSS in this way. OK. Oh, hello. Conclusion. Warning. Big ideas. <laughs> OK. Story time. Small story time. OK. How the math hater became a programmer. I hate math. This is 14-year-old Lara, me, my self-portrait. She hates math. She loves art class and horses. Fast forward a few years. This is 2009. I had, <laughs> I had some large glasses and some blonde in my hair at the time. 20-year-old um, Laura in art college had a weird idea for a video game. And I learned to code because I had freedom at my college and a lot of support from my parents. 
Fast forward a few more years, I had been freelancing, uh, building WordPress sites, and doing some front end work. And I wrote this article for CSS Tricks in 2015. This is about a job interview I went on where they asked, it was, I think the job title was UX engineer. UX engineer slash interaction designer. And I kind of met almost like 90% of the qualifications in the job description. And I was like, yes, I'm so pumped. We had like really good conversation about style guides and, and some other things. And then in the interview, they asked me an algorithm, algorithms question, fizzbuzz. And I was like, why would you do that? Because <laughs> I, I was so far, my education, my coding education was so far removed from what algorithms, traditional algorithms are and algorithms interviews. I was freelancing for a long time and I was like, what? Uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how to do this. So I, and I wrote this article about that experience. And, you know, later that day, it was reposted, it was posted on Reddit, on our programming with a different title, designer applies for a JavaScript job, fails at FizzBuzz, then proceeds to write five-page rant about job descriptions. <laughs> oh my god. Missing the point. But okay, that happened. So after that, I was like, Oh, this is what I do, HTML and CSS. There's computer science over there, not for me, like not what I do. So I had kind of two-year spam where I was like, nope, I don't need to learn this, like forget it. Then, late 2017 comes around, and I got an interview uh, for a job I was super interested in, and I had to do a whiteboarding interview, and I had to learn about algorithms to do this interview. And so I was like, god damn it, like fine, if this is really the only reason I have to learn this, fine. And I wrote a bunch of blog posts about it. I put myself through a computer science boot camp and kind of just made my own little table of content, like course directory for myself and learned a lot of stuff and definitely failed the interview. But I did get some of the problems right. I learned a lot about computer science. And I was like, whoa, actually, it's kind of 2018 rolls around. I'm like, wait, this is for me because this is very interesting and I like this stuff a lot. And then I gave this version one of Algorithms of CSS talk. And my goal with that talk was to bridge this gap between computer science and CSS and HTML. Because in my mind, they were such separate things. But I really liked computer science and I really liked CSS. Like, why, why are these so separate? CSS is on computers. There has to be some like overlap here. Jeez. And so throughout this talk, CSS, or throughout my you know, researching this talk and learning computer science and looking for those connections, CSS went from like, oh, I write this, this is my job, it's cool, to like, oh my god. <laughs> like, CSS is so amazing. What's happening? I mean, we just saw like these, like how browsers work. And when you have a little bit of an appreciation for what that imperative, like what's happening at the bottom of that iceberg, I was just like, oh, I'm like constantly mind blown. I'm like, that's a miracle. <laughs> so. I was like, wait, this is not what computer, this is not the right metaphor. This is the right metaphor, computer science. Like, okay, all this stuff is in here. And of course, HTML and CSS are in here. <sighs> Obligatory fizz buzz in CSS here. <laughs> so you can absolutely do, like, this is, yeah. So if you ever get asked fizz buzz in an interview, please write it in CSS. <laughs> please, that's great. <laughs> so, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's that. Okay, 2019, here we are. Is blank a blank? That's this, the structure of this question I'm asking. <clears throat> is CSS a programming language? So this is kind of a messed up question, uh, question structure. Because depending on what you substitute in these blanks, it becomes like not cool real fast. Is depression a treatable illness? Is non-binary a gender? Like yes, these, the answer to all of these questions is yes. Um, but when you, when you put things in this structure, you're kind of asking what the essence, like, is this, does this thing qualify? Is this thing included in this larger concept? And people are free to say no. So this is like a smelly question, but it kind of exposes this culture smell. Of course, is the answer here. Like, why is there, I mean, a bias, obviously, but still, what's going on? Like, what is going on? So we have all this, like, in the, the in our industry, there are, there are, the, there are designers at companies designing systems, but they can't get their companies to hire HTML and CSS people because that's not considered engineering. Or 
or we have full stack developers graduating from boot camps that don't know what the cascade is. So now HTML and CSS are like not part of the stack. Like what is going on? So I was explaining this kind of phenomenon. I was like, I don't understand why people don't see this as programming to someone at uh, my co-working space named Dick. And he is probably in his like mid 60s, has been you know, programming for a long time, kind of old school computer science person. And I was like, so Dick, like this thing's going on. Like what, what, is, what is a programming language? Can you tell me what a programming language is? Um, and he's like, well, it's a language for, that enables a human to interact with a computer. And I was like, okay. And I explained like what, like why, kind of telling him about this poll and about my talk and the whole concept. And he's like, well, Laura, when it comes to computer science, there's an 800 pound girl in the room and it's called testosterone. I was like, oh man. So I'm, I'm kind of in my mind, I'm like, why, did, why is this happening? Like maybe people just understand programming differently, but like maybe this is kind of the messy truth here of what, like why this is happening. Is like tech has a diversity problem. We know this. So, and I think this is so important, like calling HTML and CSS a programming languages, CSS as pro, like using the word algorithm to talk about CSS is so important because I think about my own story and kind of this math hater, 2003, little baby Lara. The only reason I got into code is because I had freedom at college and supportive parents. So that is the, that's kind of the, the career, that's why we have such weird career paths. Like so many of us get into programming for this, for random reasons, like chance reasons that I, th I think in a lot of cases we encounter because we have a lot of privilege. And there are a lot of people that don't have that privilege that would be very valuable people to have in technology. So maybe HTML and CSS can be this kind of golden springboard that can spring people into all kinds of programming, into technology, into solving major problems. Not in a way where it's like, oh, here, learn how to write some code, HTML and CSS. Okay, bye, HTML and CSS, let's do real programming now. But like, yeah, this is programming. Like, you're doing that, like, you, you like this stuff. Because a lot of people like HTML and CSS who are not necessarily interested in programming initially, but if we kind of oh, like, emphasize those overlaps, maybe we can have like little baby Lara, woo, <laughs> into major problems. But not just people that look like me, all kinds of people. <laughs> oh, I'm not that good at drawing people. So here's a small monster. But maybe this monster is a metaphor for creativity. We get more creativity and more design-minded people onto engineering teams and into this problem solving process. So golden springboard, why aren't we bowing down to HTML and CSS as programming languages? <laughs> I'm like, what's going on? So yeah, I'm curious like what everybody thinks about this. I think it's a big deal. Anyways, that's my talk. Thank you. Hi, Laura. Yay, my talk's over. <laughs> Mine's still continuing. Okay, yes. I've been all day. Um, the question on everybody's lips, well, the th word on everybody's lips is, Jesus, your slides are so cool. Thanks. <laughs> How long did it take to do? It sounds like it'd be a lot more work than I just type up a few things. Here's words. You really want an answer to that? Yeah. Uh, well, I draw it on the iPad. So I have like a little iPad and the iPad pencil. Um, and I draw them all in Keynote. It's actually kind of a good drawing tool because it has limitations. Um, yeah, it's been, they've been working on this for a long time. Like kind of another job almost. <laughs> but I like, them. I like this stuff. I like researching it and drawing about it. It's kind of fun to see the, the images come together and figure out what the metaphors are. So Very cool. Somebody wants to know a little bit more detail on what design engineer means oh. as your job? Great question. So the title design engineer comes from, my understanding, kind of like uh, industrial design and, and architecture and um, also video game engineering, where the design engineer is the person that communicates, it's kind of the link between um, the design team and the engineers. 
And so this person who, like between the ideators and the people actually implementing it, so you're like this translator. So I think that's where that initially came from. I didn't uh, choose it per se, but I, I like it. I think it's a good title and um, maybe it could be a, a title we could like glorify. Maybe engineer, <laughs> like everybody likes to call themselves engineer. Yeah, get a little more interesting with it at least. Yeah. Um, final question over from uh, Adectio. And Jeremy, uh, he asked about the single responsibility principle, the idea yeah. that a single module should have one thing that it does. And it looks like from your design that you're moving this over into classes as the point of contact for the thing that does one thing. Is this accurate? Do you have any thoughts on this sort of deal? Into classes versus? Versus like the HTML elements themselves. They're now serving like multiple purposes. Oh, so it's kind of like agnostic to the HTML. Yeah. Um, I think for, so for like PMC's purposes, it's really hard to predict what the HTML will be. So um, I'm, I'm not sure I entirely understand the question, to be honest. Maybe you could That's say totally it. reasonable. Yeah. So I didn't ask All right, I'm well. like, I'm, <laughs> no, I'm, I'm trying to like get the click moment in my mind and I don't think I have it, so. Okay. Well, that's fine then. Um, that case, thank you very much, Laura. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. <laughs>